I'm Rick O'Shea, the literary curator of the UCD Festival, and I'd like to welcome you to this, the second virtual edition of UCD Festival at Home for 2021. The UCD Festival is unique and award-winning, one where the global UCD community of students, alumni, future students, and also the wider general public join us for free online events. For the second year, we're not on campus, but instead where you are bringing you all of the inspiring, engaging and informative activities of the regular festival here for our digital and worldwide festival audience to enjoy. I'm particularly thrilled to be highlighting the series of UCD Festival at Home Conversations. There are over 20 chats and discussions taking place and with nearly 100 free virtual and engaging events also running across the weekend, there's something for everyone in the family to enjoy. You can stay up to date on the full UCD Festival at Home program at UCD ie slash festival and don't forget you can join the conversation through the chat function on youtube or on twitter using the hashtag ucd festival do get involved thanks for joining us and enjoy the event hello everybody i'm olivia o'leary i'm the presenter of rte radio one's poetry program and um i'm gonna be the facilitator for our discussion today on poetry in the free state. The free state did last until 1949, but for the purposes of our discussion, we're going to keep to the 20s and the 30s. So I'm joined by Professor Lucy Collins from the UCD School of English and by two of our leading poets, Jessica Trainer and Peter Sir. Lucy, you've written a lot about this period. You know, one's inclined to look at this period and think Yeats, 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 and no women. But how long was the shadow of Yeats and the Celtic revival? Well, it was a long shadow. I mean, there's no doubt that if we look at the history of Irish literature, we see the revival period and Yeats, obviously, as a towering figure. And if we think in terms of poets trying to articulate themselves as Irish and write about Irish material, it's quite difficult for them to do that, I think, in the post-revolutionary uh, period without reference back perhaps, to, uh, to revivalism and specifically to Yeats. Um, but it's also worthwhile thinking about the fact that Lots of poets did not embrace the revivalist aims and specifically wanted to do something distinct and different in their work. And so, as in everywhere, as in every culture, I suppose, in Ireland, we have a kind of variegated approach to the writing of poetry in those years. Yeah. Well, Peter and Jessica, I mean, your contemporary poets, today's poets, does that shadow reach you two at all, Peter? Uh, probably in a very indirect way. I mean, I'm, I mean, not in terms of kind of direct influence or anything like that, maybe, but in terms of the excitement of the work of, and and the context and all that. I mean, I mean, the great kind of writers of of the arrive uh, of the revival, but also the excitement of those who engage with it, like the likes of Seamus, much lamented Seamus Dean, and you know Dennis Donoghue and Declan Kyber, the kind of intellectual excitement around the revival uh, that that lasted. You, you know, um, like you know, thinking back to to. To being a student and studying all that and being greatly uh, impressed by, by by it and you, you can't but be impressed by the by the sheer uh, achievement of the writers of of that era in terms of direct influences on, on on you know as a poet probably much much less although I find myself um as I as I age uh, gracefully um or not um I find myself coming back to Yeats now a lot more uh, and kind of re-engaging with him and being enormously impressed with with the region particularly the work of this period in fact yeah it, it is enormously impressive i'm, I'm always yeah. impressed every time i go back and and, and realize how skilled it was jessica what yeah. about you? Do, you do you live under that shadow um, I, I find it, I think it's quite hard as an Irish writer not to be in some kind of dialogue with Yeats uh, at, at one stage or another. Um, but for me, what really interests me is that kind of transition from the, the revivalist work to modernism um, and the very different kind of political engagement that that includes. Um, you know, there's the, the, the kind of the, the, the romantic engagement with politics that uh, is is kind of a little bit more subsumed in the earlier work, and then Yeats kind of emerges, I find, over the course of of, of the early twentieth century, towards his modernist works, into somebody who is commenting on society in a very direct way, 
And in a way that we forget the immediacy of it, I think, because it feels like history now and it's the history of the formation of our state. Um, but I think there's something interesting in being an Irish poet and the tensions between the lyric drive, which I think is very strong in Irish poetry, and then the more kind of political drive and where we all sit on that spectrum at various times in our career. And um, so I find myself grappling with those ideas a lot still, personally. Well, just because I, I, I always feel if you're talking about poetry, you've got to quote some of it. It's like talking about music and never playing any of it. So, Jessica, could I ask you to read a typical Celtic revival poem, Yeats's Red Hanrahan's song about Ireland? And for brevity, we're just going to take two verses. The old brown thorn trees break in two high over common strand under a bitter black wind that blows from the left hand. Our courage breaks like an old tree in a black wind and dies, but we have hidden in our hearts the flame out of the eyes of Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan. The wind has bundled up the clouds high over Knocknaray and thrown the thunder on the stones for all that Maeve can say. Angers that are like noisy clouds have set our hearts a beat, but we have all bent low and low and kissed the quiet feet of Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan. Lovely. Although, although, and Peter, yeah. If I could just put in rudely there, no, because because I was saying it's very it's very much Jason kind of pre, very early. I mean, it's kind of that's 1904, so it's kind of very much pre pre free state mode. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, how much difference the the eights that that comes into play from say you know 1919 or 1921? I mean, a hundred years ago, he publishes Michael Robarty's on the dance with amazing you know poems like like Easter 1916 and and. Yeah. Um, second coming and, and, and all of the rest of that and then you have the tower and meditations in time of civil war so you know politics as Jessica mentioned right at the forefront of, of, of the work so a very different kind of Yeats um, bestrides the, the whole um, era of the of the free state you know well, perhaps I was choosing a sort of a typical one that people would have remembered even from 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 school days sure, but Peter sure. I, I was going to ask you to read. Um, uh, a, a poem by F. R. Higgins, who was very influenced by Yeats and 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 that whole whole period, uh, his poem "The Dark Breed." Sure. With those bony men, I'm one in the grey dusk fall, watching the Galway land sink down into stress, with dark men talking of grass by a loose stone wall, in murmurs drifting and drifting to loneliness. Over this loneliness, wild riders gather their full of talking on beasts and on fields too lean for a plough, until, more grey than the grey air, song drips from a still, through putching, reeling the dancing, ebbing the grief now. It was a particular view of Ireland, I suppose. I mean, there's a lot of sing as well in in, in that poem, one, one would have thought. But then... One had, and, and I accept absolutely the point you're making about Yeats, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about it later on, but you had a move towards modernity in others like uh, Thomas M McGreevy, who lived abroad, who knew Joyce and Eliot and Beckett, and who eventually became the director of the National Gallery of Ireland. Lucy, I was going to ask you to read, just as a contrast, a small excerpt from McGreevy's Crown Thra Neneha about a lurching cab ride through Dublin. Yes, I'll just read uh, a part from the middle of, of this poem. Trot, trot, clock, clock, lurch. Such rutty, muddy streets to clock, clock, clock on, or I inside with torso waving, hold the seat with gluteal muscles. Inquisitive street, an inquisitive moting swans. Middle-aged, drably white, sleeping now, and how long since your last absolution? Answer, 700 years. In inquisitive days, the swans gave gloom, or you saw wet lurching lamplight lights wet lurching houses. <laughs> I suppose it was just an attempt to give the contrast a, a bit in, in styles. But I just want to move us on to talk about, in that battle perhaps between revivalist and modernist tendencies, there was a very famous row 
on BBC uh, Radio, which caught some of that between F.R. Higgins, whose poem we heard that little bit earlier, uh, uh, very much in the revivalist tradition, and Louis McNeese. And Higgins informed McNeese, he said to him, you as an Irishman cannot escape your blood nor from our blood music that brings the racial character to mind. And McNeese demurred and said, I think one may have such thing as one's racial blood music, but like one's unconscious, it may be left to take care of itself. And <laughs> McNeese's view of the free state was very obvious in, in, in the Autumn Journal. Um, so before we talk about it, Peter, would you read a little bit from the uh, Canto 26 of the Autumn Journal. Why should I want to go back to you, Ireland, my Ireland? The blots on the page are so black they cannot be covered with shamrock. I hate your grandiose airs, your sob stuff, your laughter and your swagger, your assumption that everyone cares who is king of your castle. Castles are out of date. The tide flows round the children's sandy fancy, Put up what flag you like, it's too late to save your soul with bunting. Odi at quae amo. Shall we cut this name on trees with a rusty dagger? Her mountains are still blue, her rivers flow, bubbling over the boulders. She's both a bore and a bitch. Better close the horizon. Send her no more fantasy, no more longings which are under a fatal tariff. For common sense is the vogue, and she gives her children neither sense nor money who slouch around the world with a gesture and a brogue and a faggot of useless memories. Ouch. Uh, ouch, ouch. Although it's a lot more complicated than that, I have to say, because I mean, and also, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I remember that, that, that famous kind of BBC argument there with, with um, F.R. Higgins and, you know, one of them said, Higgins says to, 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 to McNeese, you know, can any of your crowd sing? And then, and then uh, McNeese replies, can any of your crowd think? You know, this kind of stuff. But in fact, he was, he, he was an admirer of Higgins. I mean, he, he, he wrote, he, he, you know, he has him, um, in a, uh, um, he talks about him. He, 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 he actually admired his craft and, and all of that. So it's not quite, I mean, I know, I mean, I mean Higgins, was often attacked by um, Kavanaugh, um, viciously attacked by Kavanaugh as a kind of book leper and a kind of somebody who's chasing the authentic, trying to invent himself as an as a as an Irishman, um, or as a as a kind of fisherman, or as a kind of simple peasant, and all of that. But it's, it was a bit more complicated, you know. I mean, it, 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 he he was of his time, and and McNeese's relationship with Ireland was is a lot more complex than I think than than comes across in that excerpt from the journal. You know, so it was a lot more nuanced. I mean, he was of Ireland. He he wrote of Belfast. He wrote of Dublin. Um, you know, in 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 the Autumn Journal, he's there in London pre-war, and you know, he's he, he's he's very much he's he's writing of the spirit of the times, but he's always engaged with Ireland um, as well. So it's always, it's, it's a slightly more, and, and of course, that passion, you know, that's, that's also an engagement with, with, with Ireland. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, yeah. yeah I, think, I mean, that was, have to, I, yeah. you protest a lot, but I have to say one of the great things about this, doing this exercise, doing, you know, was to go back and I, you know, I read the, the, the whole of the Autumn Journal and I just thought, what a great poem. Like, it was, what a pleasure it was to, to, to kind of re-engage um, with that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, Jessica, of course, and it's picking up the point Peter was making earlier, um, there's there's a lot to Yeats. It was a long life and he travelled a long journey in that time. And um, and some of the later poems are very, very different from the early mm. Celtic uh, twilight, twilight poems. So, I mean, he himself w would accept that he had moved on from the Celtic revival, wouldn't he? Oh, absolutely. And I think that's one of the reasons why I tend to, to ultimately get on with Yeats, even if I argue with him occasionally, is there is that self-awareness um, of a journey made. And I mean, I think he, even in the, in the, in the Celtic Twilight poems, there is a, a, a political bent there, which is, you know, we have Kathleen Houlihan mentioned um, in the, the extract that I read earlier. Um, but the journey that he takes is so interesting. And I think it is summed up um, very neatly in the circus animals desertion between the notion of kind of 
poetic politics in the realm of symbol and then the actuality of politics. Um, and of course, his discovery of that kind of captured wonderfully and so wonderfully rendered in Easter 1916, where the reality of the, the political upheaval around him becomes something that he has to meet head on in a way that's difficult for him and painful and difficult and painful for those around him. I mean, there's a wonderful response that Maud Gaughan wrote uh, to the poem uh, when he sent it to to her. Um, and, you know, I don't think she's given enough credit as a, as a really kind of fascinating intellect in her own right. And a lot of her response is, you know, what gives you the right to reflect on these current events and these people that we know in this way? Um, you know, a little bit of a how dare you? Um, and of course, now in retrospect, we're delighted that he did because we have this wonderful poetic um testament to that moment in time and um, but yeah it was a difficult journey for him and it's one that he 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 records every single moment of it through his poetry and the poem shows the extent of that journey so would you read a little excerpt the last bit really of the circus animals desertion jessica it was the dream itself enchanted me Character isolated by a deed to engross the present and dominate memory. Players and painted stage took all my love and not those things that they were emblems of. Those masterful images, because complete, grew in pure mind, but out of what began. A mound of refuse or the sweepings of a street, old kettles, old bones in a broken can, old iron, old bones, old rags, that raving slut who keeps the till. Now that my ladder's gone, I must lie down where all ladders start, in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. And I think for me that really just captures the notion of of uh, so much of Yeats's life, um, from the establishment of the Abbey Theatre, um, from the politics of something like Kathleen Lee Houlihan, the play, to his later engagement with that work, and um, his own evolution, which is kind of circular in a sense, because he's been brought to the realm of symbol, where there's a safety and a distance um, in these idealised visions of Ireland, right back to to the, the, the rag and bone shop where it all starts, where you're not safe, yeah. in a sense. Well, let's move on to Austin Clark, um, Lucy, dismissed by Yeats, left out by Yeats of the Oxford Book of Modern Verse. He, he doesn't fit quite easily, really, into the revival versus modernism argument, does he? No, he doesn't. And Clark, in fact, is is a, a contradictory figure in many ways. And I think it's because he's an untimely figure. When he begins writing, he's writing in the revivalist mode, but he's doing that at the point, you know, just beyond the high point, really, of the revival. Um, and then he tries to reinvent himself writing about um, Celtic monasticism. But of course, that's not really a very uh, popular uh, theme, uh, particularly as modernism is growing, you know, in interest in, in Britain in particular and in Europe. Um, he also has, of course, a troubled life, a very difficult relationship with the Catholic Church. And that really gives rise to the later work, which, of course, is untimely in an Another way, because it's in fact ahead of its time. You know, he's writing these amazing um, poems. Uh you know, disputing Catholic control over women's bodies, over uh, children in the state, very moving and striking poems, like perhaps 50 years before this is now part of public discourse. Um, but very difficult to fit Clark into his time in any kind of easy way. But still, you know, early on enough, he was identifying the, the tension with the, the Catholic Church. Jessica, I was just going to ask you to read a short poem of his uh, Penal Law. Burn Ovid with the rest. Lovers will find a hedge school for themselves and learn by heart all that the clergy banish from the mind when hands are joined and head bows in the dark. <laughs> Peter, he was he, he was brave enough. I mean, it, it took a certain amount of bravery to take on the Catholic Church. Yeats didn't really do it, nor Lady Gregory. They they circled around, didn't they? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's that is one of the things I suppose that that makes Clark. Um, I mean, very, very interesting from from our point of view. I mean, I mean, yeah, he took on he took on all kinds of things. He took on you know you know uh, you know all kinds of abuse by the church and and 
all you know, kind of I suppose what we what you would consider to be kind of local politics now as 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 well. And so he's very he was very much of his period and of his time, and and his he tended towards kind of satire as as well. But he engaged very strongly with the issues of of his day in and and the kind of Ireland that had been created by the by the state with with you know that kind of clerical dominance. And and I suppose those those things. Means means that because we have resolved so many of these issues, um, he kind of disappears, you know, in, and he doesn't travel um, as well, you know. So he's kind of, you know, to, to an audience outside of Ireland, he doesn't. He he he's a figure of of some kind of bafflement. They don't quite quite get him. But yet, there's extraordinary work at all at all different periods of 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 his of his life. You know, the, the, some of the earlier work and some of the later work when he comes back after a long absence, um, and the, you know, the work of his later years. Um, you know, there's there's, there's there's enormous achievement in in that. Well, I was just going to ask you to read the first and last verse of the Straying Student, which again brings in his own fight with eroticism and the attitude of the Catholic Church towards things erotic. On a holy day when sails were blowing southward, a bishop sang the mass at Inishmoor. Men took one side, their wives were on the other. But I heard the woman coming from the shore and wild in despair, my parents cried aloud, for they saw the vision draw me to the doorway. Awake or in my sleep, I have no peace now. Before the ball is struck, my breath has gone. And yet I tremble, yes, sorry, lest she may deceive me and leave me in this land where every woman's son must carry his own coffin and believe in dread all that the clergy teach the young. But can I just sneak in? Because actually my favourite line in that in that poem is the one where, yeah. you know, he, he I wrote I wrote her name. I wrote her praise nine times upon the wall in Salamanca. You know, it's this kind of, I love, I just love that line. And, and I love that. This, okay. this is Clark's kind of version of the Ashling, you know, an, an argument for a kind of erotic um, version of Kathleen Nahulahan and, 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 you know, an Ireland kind of free, free of, of oppression, uh, erotic and clerical sort of oppression, you know. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but looking... Looking back, you're conscious, I suppose, of two things. You're conscious of the heavy hand of the Catholic Church, but you're also conscious of the fact that publication was often difficult for poets, certainly, who are only known in Ireland, which may have been a, a problem for Clark. And anybody who kept a link with one of the big British publishers d did much better, didn't they, Peter? I think yeah, they did. I mean, you, you also have to think of the context as well. And I know, you know, this, this is something that Lucy has talked about as well. But I mean, one of the first things that the state does, of course, when you know, when it's when it's founded, I mean, within seven years, you, you have a censorship of publications act. You know, you have, you, you know, the, the sense that the, that the main interests of this newly formed state is to control its its creativity, control its its writers. That's the context that that Irish writers um, are operating in. That's that's very much. And Clark, Clark, of course, suffered um, directly um, for that. He loses his job. Um, you know, because he wasn't because he was married in a in a registry office, and and he moves to London. So you know, so all all of that. So so yes, but yes, yeah, so Irish writers were still as now. I mean, then as now, um, often published in in England. So they were they were creating their, um, you know, their their careers both within Ireland and and in, and in London for a London audience. I mean, that's so, so they were still positioning themselves between the two, the two cultures, and that often was was difficult for somebody like Clark who didn't quite fit into either, really. Could, could I see he, here? Yes, yes, um, come in. Just on, on that point, um, because there's some very interesting correspondence between Clark and his English publisher. Um, and it's very clear that his, his British publisher sees his main readership as in Ireland um, and really is particularly in, in, um, interested there in the reference to censorship because the British publisher was very concerned about incurring problems with the Irish censorship board through Clark's writing. And it seems very clear that they thought of him, even though they were publishing him in London, they still thought of him very much as an Irish writer. And yet he didn't have, you know, a great readership in Ireland either. So he was, as Peter is saying, kind of between, falling between those two markets, really. Jessica, your, your view of Austin Clark, I mean, did he have an effect in terms of your own writing? 
Uh, he's he's one of those poets who I think had slightly gone, you know, he started to suffer a little bit by the time my yeah. school day came around. You know, there was less Austin Clark, I think, on my, um, that I would have read during school days. And I wasn't really aware of, of the, the kind of very strong anti-clerical streak to his work until much more recently, um, which I think is fascinating because it's something we associate very strongly with Kavanaugh, who, of course, was getting handouts from John Charles McQuaid on the side <laughs> while writing <laughs> pieces like The Great hunger, which I just think is one of those wonderful contradictions, only Kavanaugh. Um, but, you know, I, I do think it's, I, I've been interested in revisiting the work lately because it, it does seem to speak of a country that's struggling for its definition and self-definition, I think. Um, and I was interested in what you said about the notion that Yeats and Lady Gregory had kind of skirted around that um, engagement with Catholicism. But of course, you know, they, they, they didn't need to necessarily you know, they, they came from this ascendancy background where their concerns were different and where and they also were writing mostly in times when this sense of what an independent Ireland could be had, had not been defined as a homogenous Catholic entity. So it's very interesting to see somebody like Clark then flounder in the waters of this very kind of monocultural new landscape, um, whereby, you know, not only are, do you suffer if you criticise the Catholic Church, you also suffer if you're uh, an artist or creative of any kind who's Church of Ireland, if you're in political life and you're a Protestant, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting and turbulent time. And I think, you know, Clark's reputation has suffered because of, you know, as, as Lucy was saying as well, that he was before his time, after his time, um, you know, and he was just existing in a, in a time when, when really Ireland had yet to settle into one definition um, and he was clearly resisting the direction it was going in. Well, looking at that period now from where we are, the first thing that strikes you is where are the women poets? Lucy, Tell us. Well, there are certainly women poets, as we know now, um, but they certainly struggled to uh, get their work published and read during the period. Now, obviously, the kind of factors we've just been discussing, um, you, particularly the, the fact there was no real poetry publishing within Ireland, that poets had to go outside Ireland to be published. The fact that poetry itself was kind of beginning to seem much more like a, a niche area of interest rather than a popular genre um, by that point. All of these were difficult for every poet, man and woman. Um, but women had a, a particularly difficult uh, time in the free state. And this was mainly because of the preeminence of the Catholic Church, of in which the kind of iconography of the Virgin Mary became the idealised woman and women were supposed to be mothers and uh, wives before they were artists or public figures. Mm -hmm. And I think in tandem with that, you see the development of a very male-dominated kind of public space for the arts. And obviously Kavanaugh, uh, who we've just been mentioning, is a classic you know, figure around which the kind of pub culture of, of the Irish poet in the free state is, is kind of identified. Uh, and so women really struggled to fit in to that, um, to that realm. But that didn't stop them writing. They were writing, but it was uh, challenging for them to be published and read. Jessica, I often wondered whether it was also um, that after emerging from what was regarded as colonial repression, which indeed it was, um, there might have been this sort of feeling that um, men, Irish men, had been bowed down by that repression and that somehow their manhood needed to be boosted, um, that they didn't necessarily need competition for women. And surely, yes, women were traditionally both m mothers and, in, and muses, and that this was the, the, the role that they were, they, were, they were supposed to take. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, obviously you see that emerging politically, um, you know, towards the, the, the zenith of all of that around the, the constitution, you know, and the mother's place or the woman's place being in the home. Um, and, you know, I always find when you read a work like uh, Ulysses, you see this kind of interesting cosmopolitan, far from perfect Dublin, but a much more cosmopolitan Dublin than, say, the Dublin of Kavanaugh, um, where, you know, the women are in the background waiting for the men to come home. Um, and they're, you know, looking at some of the, the, the poets of that era, the women poets of that era, there is a sense that a number of them went through a phase of creativity which stopped 
when either they were asked by their partners to stop being involved uh, in the literary scene um, or whether when children came along. Um, and also, I think the switch to modernism, modernism is a very um, often in many ways is quite a masculine form. Um, and often, I think when women contributed to modernism, it wasn't recognised as such so easily at the time. I mean, obviously, we now uh, we would recognise the co contribution of Virginia Woolf. There could not be modernism in the English language without Virginia Woolf. But interesting at the time to look at then her correspondence with James Joyce and what they thought of each other. Um, so, you know, so many different factors, as, as Lucy was saying, that prevented women from having, I think, the, the kind of longevity that was required at the time uh, for their names to be remembered long term. And um, I mean, there are wonderful examples like, like Lana uh, Solkow, for example, she would have had one of the longest careers and yet uh, her work faded into obscurity towards the end of her life um, and has been recognised again. But much like F. War Higgins, she would have been involved in the Abbey Theatre. She would have been involved in many different strands of, of Irish literary life. And, and even then as a woman, her reputation kind of diminished mm -hmm. later on. Peter, what about that point that Jessica makes that maybe modernism, certainly when it began, was 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 quite a, a masculine movement, and and that maybe it was almost as hostile to women as the the softer Celtic twilight had been. Yeah, I, it's funny because I, 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 I was interested to hear that. I'm not sure about. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure about it in in, in terms as an argument. In, in, I, I I think literature. I think I think. Uh, the hostility wasn't just for, uh, to, to, to do with modernism. I think it was to do with the, the kind of things that we've been talking about. That you, you know, the kind of almost like the repositioning of the role of women after the state is founded, and and you know, the much more repressive regime and the whole movement towards that 1937 constitution and the marriage bar. It's almost like a creative equivalent of the marriage bar. Um, you know, you, you know, where, where, where women are kind of prevented or, or discouraged from. Contribution in in different uh, in in you know in all kind of spheres of literary creativity, but I'm not sure. You know, if you if you look at Gertrude Stein, if you look at I mean, if you look at artists and uh, if you look at the history of modernism in general, I'm not sure if it's a modernist thing or a literary thing or just a, a fact a, a thing to do with where women found themselves positioned in that in that period, in particularly in 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 Ireland. You know, um, and just I mean, it is interesting. I mean, I'm I'm interested in in the way in which the achievement is being um, repositioned now and rediscovered. I mean, there's an anthology that came out recently. I know, I know, Lucy's got um, a very useful anthology, the you know, Portrait by Women in Ireland. But there's also one that came out from Cork and it recently called Apocalypse, which again um, features several Irish women writers and it's kind of you know um, so-called apocalyptic poets or poets of of, of that sort of um, modernist, earliest kind of kind of kind of bent, but women, you know, poetry of the forties, thirties, and forties, and so on. And there they are, a lot of those poets again coming to the fore now. Mm -hmm. Lucy, you probably know more than any of us do about the women poets of that period. So, what tell us the names we should know. Well, I think, I mean, just before I do that, just to pick up on uh, on Peter's point, I think, and to say that, in fact, the revival period was one of quite some success for women poets. Um, and so in some ways, it's that transition from, and we see this in other cultures as well, uh, the transition from that sort of late 19th century, more sentimental mode of writing, which seemed to be considered acceptable for women. And I think the transition into modernism was, you know, ch challenged, um, not perhaps in America so much, but certainly in Ireland, um, it was a challenging thing. And there was that sense in which if women were trying to, you know, push the boundaries of what they were doing formally, it was seen as an error. You know, it wasn't seen as an achievement or a daring try as a, a, it would be for a man. It was instead seen as a mistake, you know. Um, but of the, I mean, the most obvious woman, perhaps, uh, in that respect, it has already been mentioned by uh, Jessica, and that's Blanet Salkeld, you know, who wrote some extraordinary work. Um, it was very well received first by uh, Samuel Beckett. She got a very good review for, for her first book. 
But after that, she really struggled to get a publisher. Um, she worked in very experimental forms, in, in sequences, in very abstract kind of ways. Um, so she's one person who would have kind of fallen victim to her desire to be different, to have a different voice in poetry. Um, there are other figures. I mean, Sheila Wingfield is a really interesting uh, figure as well, kind of doubly disabled by being part of the ascendancy at a time when that was really uh, not a good place to be. Um, a really interesting formalist poet who didn't really write about Ireland very much, you know. And that's another thing, of course, which placed some of these women slightly on the on the boundaries of, of the Irish tradition. Um, Mary Devonport O'Neill, um, arguably, you know, the first modernist poet to be writing in Ireland. You know, um, the other modernists like, um, you know, Brian Coffey or Dennis Devlin or indeed Thomas McGreevy that we spoke about earlier, um, they're outside Ireland, but she's actually in Ireland uh, writing some amazing work, although just publishing one book of poems. Uh, and then we move on to, to Frida Lawton, who I, I, I know we'll come to in a moment, another extraordinary poet, um, again with just one book. So there is a sense that there are these women who are really prepared to push the boundaries, um, but they're not achieving the longevity, I think, that their male counterparts are, are managing. Well, let, let's hear some of their, their, their words. Jessica, I'm going to ask you to read a poem by Mary Devonport O'Neill, who was just mentioned there by Lucy, and it's called An Old Waterford Woman. On the road overhead to the passers-by, listen, she said, inside this cliff are the dead. They cry because they are dead. You hear, said I, the cry of the wind in the hollow face of the cliff. Within the cliff, there is only earth. And what, she said, are the dead but earth? I love this one. I think for me, it has kind of shades of, of Mortino Kynes, Cray and Achilla about it. Um, and it has this wonderful, um, as you were saying, Lucy, the notion that she's working from within Ireland. It's so Irish and it's so modernist at the same time um, that I just think it's a, it's a fabulous example of, of what we, we hope to find in this era, the kind of work we hope to find emerging. Um, and it's so wonderful to hear some of those voices being, uh, being recentered, I think. Well, um, Lucy, you mentioned uh, Frida Frida Lawton. Uh, Frida lived in County Down, didn't she? I don't know if she she was born in Ireland. No, she was born in the UK, um, and she lived for a time in Dublin, but um, mainly in County Down. Yeah, and um, we don't know very much about her biography up to now. But now, as as you know, Olivia, um, her her family have been have been discovered, and and Emma Penny uh, is working with them and uh, on bringing some more of her poetry forward. So that's really exciting to kind of be able to retrieve more of that work that has been has been lost. is so exciting. And I think the um, Cork University Press is bringing out uh, a book in, in which her poems are, are featured. I think it's due in the autumn. Um, so uh, so that, that'll that be interesting to hear. So I particularly liked um, uh, one of her poems, uh, and I think Emma Penny actually read it on the poetry programme already, but I'm going to take my life in my hands and read that one now. And it's called The Woman with Child by Frida Lawton. How I am held within a tranquil shell, as if I too were close within were close within a womb, I too enfolded as I fold the child, as the tight bud enwraps the pleated leaf, the blossom furled like an enfolded fan, so life enfolds me as I fold my flower. As water lies within a lovely bowl, I lie within my life, and life again lies folded fast within my living cell. The apple waxes at the blossom's root, and like the moon, I mellow to the round, full circle of my being, till I, too, am ripe with living, and my fruit is grown. Then break the shell of life, we shall be born, my child and I, together, to the sun. I, 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 I like that one. It just goes to show that we did actually have people writing about pregnancy and bringing up a baby uh, even before Ivan Boland did it. Um, 
but how much recognition she 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 got for it, I don't I don't know. There were other poets, Lucy, weren't there? I mean, what, what about Eva Gore Booth? Yes, I mean, Eva Gore Booth is in a way we're sort of going a little bit back in time uh, to retrieve Eva Gore Booth. Really interesting figure, of course, in, interestingly, you know, not noted by Yeats as a poet uh, when he writes about her, but she's an extremely striking poet and a poet for whom both her, her activism, you know, she as, as you know, she lived in, in Britain for most of her adult life and she was very active in women's rights and uh, in, in um, education and, and uh, children's issues and so on. Um, and a very powerful speaker by all accounts too. So she combined that sense of activism with a highly spiritual approach to poetry, a quite a philosophical um interest as well. And I think the really interesting thing about her poetry is that it combines those different elements. It combines the political uh, with this this more philosophical, reflective uh, and highly symbolic dimension too. Uh, and she's, you know, a classic case of that generation of women who could combine those different roles um, and also who saw poetry as an important vehicle uh, for bringing forward those ideas um, to readers. Peter, was there any? Sorry, Um, I I just want to say I think it's so interesting though the way that uh, you know her her life is appraised by by Yeats. Um, in in memory of Eva Gore Booth and, and Con Markovitz, when when he talks about her voice growing shrill, um, in terms of her activism, uh, that's one of the moments where I I, I find myself in an argument with Yates, I think, yes. because she achieved yes. so many wonderful things. <laughs> she did. In a moment, we're going to use that dreaded word, strident, which women must <laughs> never ever be. Peter, looking back then on on that period, and I'm particularly talking about the 20s and the 30s um, and the poetry of that time, um, are, are you impressed or are you sad for all the shadows that perhaps kept it as a less creative time than it might have been? Well, I think I think it's amazing how much you know how much work was was produced, you know, and and you have. I mean, we've just kind of we've we've touched on the kind of different sorts of traditions and the, if you like, the poetry coming out of the Joyce and the experimental kind of side of things, and and, and the poetry that's more traditional, the poetry produced by by women. Um, you know, given the conditions and given what was, what was happening in, in in the country and the and the kind of limits, um, I I I, th- I think the the body of work that that comes out of that um, from the, from the poets that we've mentioned. I mean, we've, we just kind of glancingly kind of touched on some of these. And the, another one I'd add is Porig Fallon, the major poet I think, who rarely gets a look in, um, as as well, and who very kind of much kind of explicitly dealt with the with the the impact of Yeats um as well. But no, I think I think they're 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 they're, they're extraordinary. I mean, you know, McNeese, Kavanaugh. Um we've 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 looked at I mean we've we've heard the poetry of, of, of Frida Lawton, mentioned Sheena Wingfield, Don Salkeld, all of these. But you know, so I no, I, I think um we got more poets than perhaps more good poetry than perhaps as a state we deserved, as often as as, <laughs> as is often the case. <laughs> Jessica, did we get more good poetry than we deserved? <laughs> Um, I think really the the w- one of the issues has been the kind of the emissions of various different anthologies over the year has created a very fractured history which we're trying to piece together, um, and I think that is being addressed. Um, and it's wonderful to see these poets uh, emerge, as I said, and it's emerging from what? It's a terrible way of putting it, but I, I do think that. It, it, it might be more difficult cre- to create the kind of smooth narrative that one expects from these kind of anthology of 20th century Irish writers. You know, how are we going to kind of heal those fractures between the revivalists, the modernist, the people working in various different timelines? I don't think that that will ever be easy to address. And I think it'll be a long time before we can see a kind of a selection of these poets that feels like it has a real flow to it um, and that feels easily explainable in historical terms and mapped onto the development of the state. Um, but yes, I would agree. I think that the poets are there, the poetry is there, um, and great work is being done to, to bring them back to the light. And Lucy, a last word to you. Did, 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 did poets manage to find their freedom in the free state? <laughs> 
Well, I think they are finding their freedom now, as as Jessica's pointing out. And I think that, that her point is really key as well, that we're not going to get, you know, a clear narrative, you know, a neat uh, arrangement of poets. And in fact, if we did, that would be a, a, a thing to be alarmed about. Instead, we're going to be able to go back. We're going to be able to, you know, dig out lots of really interesting poets, you know, through going back through journals and newspapers, as well as out of print books. And we're going to find those voices and those voices voices are going to speak to us in different ways. Um, and it's, you know, it will yield this much more mixed uh, and open-ended, uh, I think, canon of Irish poetry. And that's that's only going to be a good thing. And to Lucy Collins, Jessica Trainer, Peter Sir, just remains to say thank you and to thank the estates of the poets who allowed us to use their work.